YouTube takes kid friendly to the next level with the launch of a new app for young viewers. Is it just about protecting children or also about protecting profits? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the show. I'm Sami Zaydan. It's strange to think that YouTube, by far the world's most popular video service, has only been around for 10 years. And now its owner, Google, is looking to expand its reach even further by launching a special version of the YouTube app aimed at children. YouTube Kids, as it will be known, will offer some original episodes of popular children's shows and is designed to be child-friendly with large, colourful icons and minimal scrolling. And in a nod to parents worried about the amount of time their children spend online, the app will include a timer to limit its use. So, is this just the thing parents need to protect their children from adult content online? Or will it provide YouTube with a captive market for advertising? Let's get the perspective of our guest now on this edition of Inside Story. In New York, we have Brendan Gahan, founder of Epic Signal and YouTube marketing expert. In Brussels, Janice Richardson, senior advisor at the European School Net and a specialist on the psychological development of children. And in London, London I should say, Arrow Balkan, founder and lead designer of Indie. Welcome to you all. If I could start with Gahan. Twitter's launched Vine Kids, Netflix has its kids section. Why are social media services now so much focused on kids, it seems? Well, I think you touched on it in the beginning. It's, uh, it's about market share and advertising dollars. And eyeballs are shifting to mobile and digital. Nobody's really watching uh, TV as much. They're cord cutting. So by building an audience early on, uh, they're going to have that into, an adult, into adulthood so they can continue to advertise to them. Interesting. Ara, what sort of market are we talking about here? What is it worth when we talk about online kids marketing? Well, um, I don't know what it's worth. Uh, I'm sure that Google is getting into it because they think it's going to be worth a lot. But the question that really interests me more is, uh, is Google going to, is it even possible for Google to create a safe space given their business, which is to spy on people, to track them, and to try and learn as much about them as possible because that's what they sell to their real customers. So is a company that does this even capable of creating a safe space for children or for anyone else for that matter. So are you worried that they're going to end up manipulating kids, collecting data? I mean, what's your concern? Well, they collect data, of course. That's uh, Google's food. Um, that's what Google feeds on. That is how they get their money, by selling the data, but also the information and the insight that they derive from that data to their customers. Because when you use Gmail or you use uh, YouTube, you're not paying them, and yet they make billions, right? How are they making that money? By selling you. You're the product that they sell to their actual customers, who today might be advertisers, tomorrow might be anyone else who's willing to pay them. So yes, I have, uh, I have questions about whether or not a company whose business it is, that this is their business, whether they can create a safe space for children or for anyone else. We'll uh, pick up on the safe space concept uh, in a minute, but I want to ask Janice, when, when we look at user habits amongst children with the internet, have we seen a change? I mean, there was a time when people uh, talked about kids spending too much time on internet um, services for things like messaging and Facebooking. Is that now old school? Are kids spending more time, you know, is YouTube the thing to do now? It's make videos and upload them. Well, first of all, I think it's important to know that approximately 30% uh, of children are already online at the age of two. That is a little concerning. When we look at what children do online, in fact, what most young people do up to the age of 16, we see that 
uh, about 60% of them do spend a lot of time looking at videos. So I actually applaud this initiative and have been able to see what type of content and what type of setting will be provided. And I think that it is really important to have a curated space where there are videos which are suitable for children, but I think there is a whole lot more that is needed to go with it. So you're not worried. You think that this does provide a safe space Space. Uh, what do you mean by that in terms of the type of material that kids are exposed to that that can now be controlled Janice? Well, I think that um, having browsed through this and having tested a little bit myself, uh, I'm very interested in the content there. Um, safe space, nothing is space, uh, nothing is safe. Uh, there can always be risks. A child at the age of three or four should have a parent sitting alongside, talking about what the child is seeing, really learning and exploring with the child. But in terms of how I see uh, other things that should go with it, we know that one of the problems with young children today is that they tend to be zappers. They move very quickly from one thing to the next. I'm happy to see that there are some longer videos, but I, I'm rather concerned if children are just going to be watching two minutes of video, flick over to something else, and then something else again. And this is All actually right. the role of the parent All right, you, to you, focus you, them. Jan, you, you've touched on a lot of things, but I want to take your comment about safe space back to Arrow, because that was your initial concern, wasn't it? That the, this is not a safe space. What do you make of the argument, well, that nothing is 100% safe, this is a safer, space for kids to the current alternatives? Well, of course nothing is 100% safe, but um, we also cannot ignore why this company, in this case Google, or the same is true for Facebook, etc., why these companies exist. And they exist in order to learn as much about us as they can. So um, I guess the real question isn't whether or not Google can keep kids safe from third parties on YouTube for kids, of course they can. You know, they have the best security people in the world working for them. But we can't conflate security or curation with privacy and human rights. That's a really important distinction. So, um, I mean, to give you an example, the mafia keeps people safe from everyone but themselves. So Google will keep the kids safe from everyone, but who's keeping the kids, and us, of course, safe from Google? Let's ask that question to Gahan. Do we know what sort of policy this app will have when it comes to things like privacy, data collection, advertising? I haven't heard about privacy and data collection. What I understand so far, and the app just got released today, so I think we'll know more, is it's going to limit a few things. One is watch time. So, you know, kids aren't on there watching hours and hours of content. <clears throat> The other is parents will have a level of curation. They can kind of select what their kids are going to be able to watch, what programs. Um, the other is basically all the content within the app itself is going to be deemed child safe. So there's the content side of things. And then I would imagine that the other element would be disabling uploading, which is obviously a big issue. Um, you, know, uh, uh, you know, we're talking about child safety and kids going up online and posting personal information, sharing their lives, um, you know, could potentially leave them open to exposure and people getting personal information and tracking them down. Um, so it seems like that's primarily where it's going to be focused on content curation and then limiting a lot of the upload capabilities. One interesting uh, thing I read here was about the growth of YouTube's family entertainment channels. It's been 200% year on year. Uh, I guess my question is, um, Arrow, doesn't that really show that families want more YouTube in their kids' lives, whatever the concerns may be about how data is collected or not? I think it shows that there's a need for the service. I'm not entirely sure if the parents are entirely aware of Google's business. Um, and that, you know, in general, that the public at large isn't really aware of how much surveillance Google undertakes when you use their services and how much processing that goes into. I mean, this is all algorithmic. There aren't people looking at what you're doing and then analyzing you and psychoanalyzing you. But there are algorithms doing this constantly because they're basically trying to 
understand how you work, because that insight is what's valuable. That's what they sell. So I don't think there's enough of an awareness of exactly how this information is being used. And I think as more people become aware of it, yes, they are more concerned. There are new studies coming out that, that show that if people actually understand how their information is being used, they are concerned. Well, advertising to children has long been a, a question of ethics, and it's an issue that's become even more important in the digital age. Today's children are saturated with ads online, and advertisers are using increasingly inventive ways to target them. Interactive advert games and viral videos appear alongside more traditional banner ads, and unlike on TV, online advertisers can build up data about a child's interests or characteristics, as Arrow was explaining there. Now, one of the problems, say, researchers is that up to the age of seven or eight, children don't understand the intent of the ads. And while, for instance, in the UK, junk food adverts have been banned on television since 2007, restrictions on online advertising remain weak. Interesting point there, Janice. I, I read a report uh, by the American Academy of Pediatrics warning about the danger of so-called behavioral ads which target people according to demographics like their age group. And it noted that, quote, influence not only the buying tendencies of pre-adolescents and adolescents, but also their views of what is normal. Is there an issue to be concerned about when it comes to online advertising and how it impacts the psychology of children? Well, certainly there is, but I think here we have to uh, separate this new kids YouTube and our concerns about online advertising. Definitely a child up to the age of eight really doesn't see the difference between what is trying to be sold to him and real information that he's receiving. So I am concerned from that level. But I think that once again, if parents are watching the YouTube with the child, if parents really are understanding what's going on, then I think that there is minimal danger. I would very much like to see, and I've already expressed this to Google, a service such as this YouTube YouTube, where parents could pay a very small amount of money uh, to have absolutely ad-free. And I do understand that if you're going to produce a product, and uh, there, there is a lot of very good uh, content in this particular app, then of course it has to be paid somewhere. But from the other point of view, we are researching with Google, with Facebook, with all of the online platforms. They seem to be taking notice of what we're saying. So we share Errol's concern uh, about the protection of rights, the protection of privacy. But I think that this particular app is a minimal risk. And I very much like the different learning activities that there are in this app. Now, we need to get behind the app and actually see what data is being captured. All right, that's an interesting point, uh, Brendan. We often focus on the negative and the risks of the internet. How much well-researched have the potential benefits of the internet uh, been when it comes to, to kids and teens? You know, the idea of exchange of ideas, of increasing awareness and tolerance of other people, uh, encouraging community engage, uh, engagement. Have those sorts of impacts been well researched? Well, I think at the core, YouTube has made the world a much smaller place, so there's no doubt about it. There are educational benefits. I mean, you look at YouTube channels like Khan Academy, you know, kids or really anyone can go online and learn just about anything, how to do algebra, geometry, and so on. <clears throat> so there's benefits there. Um, I think the, the big benefit with an app like this is the reality is uh, media usage is shifting this way. Um, we've seen studies showing that um, among teens and younger uh, viewers, uh, YouTube stars are more recognizable than mainstream celebrities from TV and films. So uh, clearly this is where the youth is going for you know, information and entertainment. Um, YouTube is really leaning into that and getting ahead of it in a lot of ways in a beneficial, positive way by providing a, a sandbox that uh, is gonna provide a level of um, safety. Now, obviously there's no such thing as a sure thing, but um, this will at least provide some sort of 
uh, space for kids to play in that's not going to expose them to a lot of risque content. Okay, but there are risks, Arrow. You've, you've highlighted some of the concerns there. Are laws and regulations the answer? I mean, if you look at the world of television, for example, in the U.S., the U.S. Congress passed the Children's Television Act to regulate that explosion of kids' shows that we had in the 90s. Has this sort of online kids' world escaped that level of regulation and scrutiny when it comes to content and ads? Um, I think that laws and regulations are definitely part of the answer. Um, I, I think it would be extremely naive to expect companies, corporations, especially ones with this business model that I talked about earlier, uh, to self-regulate because it's, it's not in their interests to do so. Um, and I think that you'll also find that there's a very big difference in how we approach privacy in the United States and how we approach privacy here in Europe. Um, and uh, that has you know, historic reasons. Um, in the U.S., it's much more piecemeal. The legislation also is much more piecemeal and in response to, uh, to new developments in various areas with a lot of focus on self-regulation, of course, coming out of the kind of laissez-faire capitalism that exists there. But, you know, uh, we were in the middle of World War II um, and we've seen firsthand the ramifications that uh, release of personal information can have. And so I think Europe, uh, in Europe, privacy is a fundamental human right. It's seen as that and it's protected as such under the law. So I think we will hopefully see uh, differing interpretations on, on how to approach this. But we're also seeing so much influence from these Silicon Valley companies in Europe, influencing the European Commission, in influencing um, the governments directly here in Europe, um, and trying to get us to adopt a more American approach to it, which I don't think we should. It's a, it's a dynamic and changing environment. Janice, I wanted to get your thoughts on something I can say as a father, I noticed my three-year-old already knows how to do a search on YouTube through the voice activation button. Uh, I think I learned it through her, in fact. Um, you know, how do kids pick up these skills? Is this, you know, are they sitting and watching what we do or are we learning from them or are they going onto YouTube and learning new skills by watching other kids? Well, actually, that's the very interesting thing about technology. In fact, it's built very intuitively and children do pick up how to do things and find exactly what they want online uh, from a very early age. And one interesting study that was conducted in Denmark, for example, shows that children in a preschool, although there were 20 or 30 children sitting together, each with a, an iPad or a tablet, um, they were all doing their own activity, and yet they all knew who could do the activity best, who could help when they really stumbled across a problem. So I think that it is intuitive. I think it is helping children also learn to read at a much earlier age. I think it's opening the world to many children whose parents don't actually take them places and show them things. But, there but are Janice, certainly it's also pitfalls that, and... Right, well, it's, all, it's also leading kids into trouble. If you read some of the other stats, the Association of Teachers and Lecturers in the UK saying social media and gaming are impacting children's ability to learn, to socialise, because they, they're used to what you were saying, you know, the constant stimulation of flipping. And when they get to school, they find it real world is too boring and they can't relate to anyone and can't focus on anything for too long. But I think that this explains exactly what's happening now. Young people live in two worlds. They live in the formal educational world, and then they go home and use these different tools. And we really need to bring them together. Because if we were to use Facebook as at school or any other social network at school as a learning tool, young people would really learn how to use them in a much better way, a much more meaningful way, and wouldn't waste so much time on them. So I, I think that there are very valuable tools online right, and we I should can see be using Arrow them online. Is, is shaking yeah. his head in disagreement. Let me, let me give him a chance since we're, we're, we're getting short on time here. 
Uh, Sammy, I'm going to have to disagree with Janice on that. I think putting Facebook in schools is the worst thing we can do. Again, Facebook's business is to spy on you and to analyze your behavior and to psychoanalyze you and to build a profile of you to sell to their actual customers. That's the last thing you want in a school. It's like saying McDonald's should be sponsoring uh, nutrition classes, that we should have McDonald's in the cafeterias, which some schools apparently do. Do, which is a totally different subject. Well, but but that Arrow, is not it's, it's not exactly like that, is it? I mean, what, what Janice is saying here is, all right, let, let's put aside what the companies want to do uh, and make money, but the result is sometimes positive, is it not? They're learning to read, they're learning how well, there's to nothing accomplish wrong, tasks. There's, there's nothing wrong with technology itself. Technology is neither good nor bad nor neutral, to, uh, to quote Melvin Kranzberg. Um, it is the interests behind it, behind it, who owns and controls the technology and for what purposes. In this case, they have a very, very simple business model and that business model treats people as products. So are we okay with telling kids that that is all right? That, that, that are we okay with normalizing surveillance, with normalizing that business model by actually presenting this to kids as a good thing in school? I think that's the question we need to ask. Brendan, Actually, is there... I All right, think go ahead. What, Sorry, Dennis, I go think... ahead. Yes, I think that one thing we're actually missing around this table is a, a, a young person because they don't need companies to tell them what privacy is or to shape their approach. Young people, I'm always amazed that they really see what's happening and what I really think we need, and you touched on the subject of regulation a little earlier, I think that the only answer is co-regulation, in fact, when we have all of the partners around the table, the kids, the parents, industry, teachers, this is what is not happening at the moment. We attend the Internet Governance Forum every year, and yet the education ministers are rarely present. So I'd like to see us all working much better to look at the good, to look at the bad, weigh it up and find the, bo the best, the most appropriate solutions. All right, I've got some grey hairs here, so I can't weigh in on the whole young people's thing, I think. But, Brendan, if I could get you, I think we could call you a relatively young person. I mean, what's your take on, on co-regulation? Um, <clears throat> uh, thank you, by the way. Um, so I, I think, uh, you know, how it's regulated is, is probably a little bit out of my wheelhouse, but the reality is that this is no, the what's your feelings on it? I mean, I mean, we're talking about how. Do, do, you know, are, are you optimistic about you know suggestions that maybe there should be regulation, or do you think that you know that's the last thing that young people need is is more regulation? Yeah, I mean, I, I, with regards to, I think there should always be limitations around, especially targeting to children. And I know there are a lot of limitations within the U.S. I'd be actually curious to see what kind of data uh, YouTube can actually pull. I know there's um, limitations in ad targeting already on YouTube. You can't target users. I believe it's, it's under 18 or 13. So there's going to be a lot, a lot of limitations in place already. And I think that's important. Obviously, kids are impressionable. Um, but the flip side of that is, is you know, um, this is where kids are consuming content. And while it is in YouTube's best interest to create something like this, they're going to be getting this audience uh, more rapidly, ideally, getting them uh, you know, acclimated to YouTube uh, earlier on. <clears throat> but that's already happening. And so uh, this is one step in the right direction to create a slightly safer space. Um, but, but definitely, is there a I agree risk, that Brendan, there needs here, to be some increasingly sort of. Increasingly, uh, people are growing up on the internet now. Is there a risk there? I mean, God only knows if during at least my youth, if the internet existed uh, in the form it does now, the sort of things that adults might have posted that they'd be quite embarrassed about later on in lives. You can't, there's no delete button, is there? Well, yeah, no, I agree with that. And I think, um, you know, by, uh, you know, preventing uploading, that's going to be, a, a, you know, a key part of things. I mean, we don't want people, kids posting personal information and so on. But too much of anything is a bad thing. And I think YouTube has a lot of benefits. I mean, it's a reflection of the real world. It's the reflection of the people that are creating content. So there's a lot of good and a lot of bad, but everything in moderation.
It's been a fascinating discussion, but I think we're going to have to leave it here for now. Let's thank our guests in New York, Brendan Gahan, founder of Epic Signal and YouTube marketing expert. In Brussels, Janice Richardson, senior advisor at the European Schoolnet and a specialist on psychological development of children. And in London, Arrow Balkan, founder and lead designer of Indy. And thank you for joining us. If you've got anything you'd like to add, you can go over to our program page at aljazeera.com. You can post your comments at facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story or send us your tweets at AJ Inside Story. I'm Sami Zaydan. From the whole team for now, it's goodbye.